because of when it was taken. This was about three months ago, two months ago, uh, at my dad's uh, birthday gathering. Uh, that is significant in that, well, you know, my dad's a little older than I am, so it's a big birthday, but also significant in that uh, he actually allowed us to gather in, for his birthday. He's, he's, a, he's not the most social person in the world. But also, it's, it's one of my favorites, more so because of who's in it. That's my wife, Natalie, and our three grandkids, three boys. Um, and so, yeah, I'm the preacher, and I'm the one that gets to put stuff up on the screen, so you're just going to have to, like, deal with this, all right? These are my grandkids. Um, on your, what would be your left is our youngest grandson. That is Bennett. Uh, I can't tell whether Bennett is having a good time or just trying to get out of there. I don't know. Uh, he is uh, about seven months old, almost to the day. Um, then next in the middle, uh, with the goofy look on his face, which is typical, uh, that is Nathan. He's, uh, Nathan is five? Yes, just turned five last month. Did I get that right? Yes, no, six. Oh, I would be in trouble. He's six. Anyway, uh, then next on, the, on what would be your right, the one that looks like he's, I don't know, trying to say something, that is Zachary. Zachary's our oldest grandson. And um, Zachary, you know, the oldest, the first, right? So you, I've experienced everything for the first time as a grandfather through him, right? And I remember um, about, uh, three, probably about four years ago now, he's eight, uh, he moved through that first stage of testing the waters, you know, not the terrible twos, but really later than that, because I think it was more intentional at that point. Testing the waters, you know, uh, pushing the limits in, in what he was thinking or saying and doing. He was he's asking the question, who is really in control here, right? And in one of his longer visits to our home, I think it was during the summertime that year, this all kind of came to a head. And so to help Zachary figure out the answer to this question of, you know, who is in control, he and I developed a little routine, and it went something like this. I would say, Zachary, who's the boss? To which he would reply, it took a little prompting, but we got there. Well, mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa. Yeah. So Zachary, when someone's the boss, what does that mean to you? Well, it means that I need to do what they tell me to do. And me to Zachary, well, wh why are mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa telling you things to do? Zachary says, well, because they're trying to teach me what is right. And I say, and why are they trying to teach you what is right? To which he would reply, because they love me. And this was a routine that, that once we both memorized our parts, uh, it, it played itself out over that three or four day stretch over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there were some times when the intensity level because of what was happening at the moment was higher than others. And sometimes despite Zachary's answers, which after we'd practiced it enough were always the same, well, let's just say his heart wasn't always in it right? Who does that remind you of? Who's the boss? It's a good question. Who's the boss? It's a good question, and it's a question that, that this Advent season demands that we answer for ourselves. And so with that, I want to say welcome to our sermon series called Come and See, uh, where we're focusing on the characters in, in the Bible story of Jesus' birth. And as we do this, I'm inviting you to come and see, yes, the baby Jesus lying in a manger, Emmanuel, we sang about it, God with us, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I'm inviting you to come and see baby Jesus, yes, but I'm also hoping and more importantly, I'm hoping you'll catch a glimpse of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God calls you to do as well.
in this coming of Christ anew that we call Advent and Christmas. And you can catch up on, we, we've already had a couple of conversations. Actually, I say conversations, they're more monologues, right? That's what sermons are. But we've had a couple of sermons already. If you need to catch up on them, you can go to our website or our YouTube channel and take a look and listen. But today we're going to focus, our, we're going to shift our focus to a character in the story of Jesus' birth that we don't normally focus on a lot, and there's probably good reason for it. Today we're going to shift our focus to King Herod, and I want to invite you, encourage you to follow along with our sermon scripture reading today. You, uh, it's in Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9, and then skip down and read verses 13 through 18. Uh, you can follow along in your own Bible, or there's a Bible there in the pew rack in front of you, or maybe pull your phone out to search for it. If you're searching for it on your phone, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version today. Do whatever you need to do to really hear God's word. Uh, and again, that's Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 9 and 13 through 18. And before we start reading, before we start reading, Dave, you got a little quick on me there, buddy. Before we start reading, I want to share a little bit of background. Thank you. <laughs> because Herod actually was a real person. The historical uh, Herod was who was what is who is known in history as Herod the Great, and he was he was the king in Judea, ancient Judea, what we now know as modern day Israel. He was king from around 37 BC until the time of Christ's birth, and he was king, but only king because of the Roman Empire's backing. And it took Herod three years after receiving the backing of the Roman Empire, who was really in control, right? Took him three years by military force to actually conquer his own people. Did you hear that? Three years to conquer his own people and become king. None of which, by the way, really set too well with the common folk of the day. If you weren't in a power position, you kind of resented Herod. Not kind of, a lot. And the seeds of rebellion against Herod were always there, kind of just, just around. And that is something that Herod knew all too well. And so he went to great lengths. There are, we, have, we have historical evidence that he went to great lengths in order to stay in power, stay in control... And we also learn that as we begin our scripture reading for the sermon today in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, magi, or wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. And when they heard the king, had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And I want to stop right there because later on, uh, our focus in our Come and See series, that spotlight will be on the Magi uh, later on. But right now, uh, they and Herod's stories have kind of intertwined here. And so we hear a little bit about them uh, and I want to say this, 
Uh, you may have a version, or you, if you know this part of Scripture, you may remember the phrase that I read that said, when Herod heard uh, you know, what the Magi said, that he was frightened. You may remember a version that says, he was greatly troubled. Frightened is actually a better translation of, the, of the, the Greek word that was originally written there. Not just frightened, but terrified. And he and all of Jerusalem, the Bible says, were frightened and terrified. They were frightened and terrified because Herod knew that those, that rebellious attitude was right there underneath the surface. And the people in Jerusalem were terrified because they had seen what Herod had done before when he got afraid of losing his power. And so it's not hard to imagine that Herod would have been a little more than just concerned about this potential rival to the throne, who, by the way, the heavens supposedly had announced this rival's arrival. And so we're going to skip down to verse 13 and pick up our story. Now after they, and this is the Magi, had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. I'm going to stop there. This is a part of the story that, again, shifts a little bit. Divinely warned, Joseph escapes to Egypt with Mary and the newborn baby, Jesus, in tow. And I'll tell you, this is probably not the first family that had ever become refugees on account of Herod and his threats. Um, but they weren't the only victims. See, when there's a power struggle at the top, it's usually the people at the bottom that feel the effects the most. Usually the people at the bottom of that power food chain, if you will, that, that catch the violence that can and did spill over into average people's lives. And we see that as we finish out our scripture reading. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled. Because they are no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, motivated by this potential new rival, Herod's extreme, well, concern, fear, it manifests itself in first deception and then violence. And Eugene Boring, who writes about this passage, he says, you know, it's really hard for us to grasp the violence that came next because it's so far beyond our context, our comprehension. You know, late one night, while everybody was sleeping, the king's soldiers might have surrounded the very small village of Bethlehem. And then at first light, a big enough group of them to take, you know, to kind of announced this happening, would have entered the town while the remaining soldiers just kind of tightened the noose around the village. And after ordering all the families with small children into the square, a thorough search would have been made throughout the whole village to ensure that everyone had complied. And then every boy that looked two years old or younger would have been pulled away from parents' arms and unceremoniously killed in front of them. And the only explanation given, if any was given at all, was, well, these are just our orders. And after the soldiers left, then the victimized families in the village would have been left to deal with the unspeakable tragedy they had been helpless to stop. See, this is not a made-for-Christmas-Eve candlelight communion 
event. Might be why we don't read this scripture often on Christmas Eve. You know, instead of the soft glow of the manger and the shepherds coming to the manger scene, the murderous jealousy of King Herod is brightly illuminated. It is on stage, front and center. And his fear of losing control, of no longer being the one with the grip on power, his fear of no longer being on the throne of his kingdom. Well, all of this results in deception, anger, and violence against, yes, the most innocent people among his own people. And another writer, Douglas Hare, shares about this passage, and he says, you know, it is easy to point a judgmental finger at Herod. It's easy to do. But he cautions and says, before you scoff, before you point that finger at Herod, don't do it until you've acknowledged the Herod in yourself. Because indeed, there's some of Herod in all of us. We all fear. We all fear arrival to the throne of our lives. We all fear arrival to the throne of our lives, even if it is Jesus. Now, for those of us not easily convinced of this, right on cue, just a few chapters over in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we see a lot of Jesus' first words and teachings. It's what traditionally in the church we call the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you just to listen to a few of the things that Jesus taught and shares in that context. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says about life with God and with other people and listen to what Jesus says as a follower of his, how that life must be lived. And I also want you to do one more thing. As you hear these words, pay attention to your gut. All right? Pay attention to your gut. Jesus' words, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I could go on, but how's your gut right now? This is Jesus. And what I want to confess to you is that it is so easy to say, God is in control. It is so easy, I confess to you, to say, Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, or to use a word maybe that we would use more commonly, Jesus is the boss. It's so easy to do that, but it's quite another thing to live with God in control, to live with Jesus as Lord, as king, as the boss. And yet, living with Jesus as the boss is one of the most fundamental parts of the Christian faith. A little later on in the gospel, Jesus said, all who want to come after me, follow me, must say no to themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
the Nicene Creed, that ancient affirmation of faith um, that we sometimes hear or say these words. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. And this might be a good place to say, you know, we don't hear the word Lord often in our time except maybe at church. What does Lord mean? It means that person that we give that title is sovereign. In other words, that person is the boss, no questions asked. And we say we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. And even the very basic kind of first time commitment or decision that is made to become a Christian, it includes this expectation You know, when one decides to to say yes to God, you know, first a confession is made, you admit that you're a sinner, that you've done things that are wrong, that are keeping you from God and for other people. Then you believe in Jesus Christ, what his life, death, and resurrection has done that can bring you mercy and forgiveness and wipe out that sin. And then the third part is you confess Jesus as Lord as king, as boss. In other words, that to the very best of your ability, you will follow only Jesus' lead from that day forward. And so living with Jesus as king, the boss, is one of the most basic requirements of the Christian faith, who we say we are. But it is, oh, so much easier to say than to do. I am confessing that to you. In fact, this time of year, it's also much easier sung than done, right? Oh, come let us adore him. Come on, you can sing with me if you'd like. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Beautiful, but there it is. Christ the Lord, the King, the Boss. So, <clears throat> this Advent Christ, and Christmas season, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try to move beyond saying or even singing that Jesus Christ is Lord and taking a step to more fully live that way. Now, although there are all kinds of things that I could ask you to try to do to move, make this step, I want to specifically ask you to take a clue, cue from John Wesley, the 18th century founder of the Methodist movement. You know, Wesley had three rules that he held the early Methodist accountable for. Do no harm, do good, and attend to the means of grace. That sometimes we change the wording a little bit to say, stay in love with God. Do the things that help you stay in love with God. Now, why am I asking you to maybe take this step to make Jesus as Lord a little more in your life by doing these things? Well, number one, we're a Methodist church. It's John Wesley, right? But what I will also say is in these rules, we see Jesus very clearly and what he calls us to do. Do no harm. You know, instead of treating others with an eye-for-eye mantra, what was it Jesus said? Do no harm. My confession to you is that's the hardest one of these three for me sometimes. Do all the good you can. Yes, Jesus says instead of hating your enemy, do what? Pray for them and love them? I gotta tell you, The closer that enemy comes to me, as in friend or family, that is hard to do. And that's what Jesus asks us to do, tells us to do. Stay in love with God. In other words, do the things that for you help you stay connected with God better than anything else. What I would say is in this time of year when life can get really busy, do the things you need to do to give God some time and space in your life. Give some things up. To make that happen. So what I want you to do this week and moving forward into Advent is just pick one of these, all right? Just pick one of these to focus on 
as a first step in living more fully into not just saying or singing that Jesus is Lord, King and Boss, but actually living into it more fully. Hmm. What was it we sang earlier? Um, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Hmm. Do we want to invite that or not? Let her earth receive her king. You know, if you don't remember anything else about what I've shared with you today, uh, remember this. If we're honest, if I'm honest, these nice titles of king and lord that sometimes we say, oh, you know, that was great back then sometime. You know, we sometimes give these titles to Jesus, we sing about them, but here's the thing. They scare us too. They do. And so my question for you is this. Will you, as we sang earlier, welcome and invite the arrival of Christ, your newborn king? Or will you perhaps deceptively pay homage, but really ignore Jesus' teachings and example and commands? Or like Herod, will you even seek to take Jesus out of your life once and for all? Who's the boss? Think about it for a moment, and then we'll move on.